So after seeing Mr. Who's the Boss's video tour of Mr. B Studio, I got a little bit jealous. So today I thought it would be fun to share with you guys the type of equipment that I use for my shoots, which is mainly sideman shoots. I've been a videographer for slightly over 10 years. I'm completely ancient. So everything you're about to see wasn't bought overnight. It's more like a, a collection over the past 10 years. One of my first ever cameras was the camera on my phone. It was like an old Nokia brick phone. That was my first camera. And then slowly I upgraded and I got better and better equipment as I progressed. So yeah, just bear that in mind when you watch this video. Also, thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Whether you need a domain, website, or an online store, make it happen with Squarespace. So when it comes to on-the-go shoots, this is the type of backpack I'd usually have on me. And this is from a company called Low Pro. This is the Pro Tactic BP450 AW2. This goes through the trenches with me. This comes with me. The reason I like this backpack is because it has so many compartments and I can fit a lot in here. Like you can put a lens here, a camera there, and then you've got plenty of zips at the back where I keep miscellaneous things, if that's what you call it. Now, depending on what type of shoot I'm doing, I could carry anything from one to three cameras in this bag. Sometimes I might go handheld and then other times I might go handheld and stick another one on a tripod. But yeah, so main cameras I usually shoot with when I am on the go. As you can see, I'm a big nerd. I wrapped my camera. <laughs> I wrapped this camera in white camo and then this camera, you can't really tell, but I've wrapped it in a black camo here and then the lens is original. This is the Sony a7S Mark III paired with a Sigma 24 to 17 mil lens. And then the white camo camera that you see is the Sony FX3. Essentially, they are exactly the same camera. This one just has a more cinematic body with it. Now the lenses, we can swap the lenses. Swapping lenses, that's fine. I usually do that quite a lot. Boom, there you go. We can mix and match if we like. But you know what, my OCD, I wanna, I don't wanna do that. These cameras have incredible autofocus. They take some amazing stills and what else? Yeah, 4K resolution up to 100 frames. Now the body of this camera feels a little bit more bulky, a little bit more satisfying to hold. And of course they both come with the flip screens like so. So you can, you can get the same viewing angle on both screens. When it comes to vlogging cameras, these are like one of the best vlogging cameras you can get. However, for those of you that haven't got the strongest of wrists or aren't used to carrying around cameras like this, it's quite a, it's quite a heavy setup. Vlogging like this, you might get a little bit tired, but I'm, I'm used to it. I run around with these on a lot of Sideman shoots. The beauty of the new Sony cameras is Sony have released a software called Catalyst Browse. The camera records metadata onto your footage that speaks with the software and tells it how to stabilize the footage, which, you know what? The results are incredible. I could be handheld with this, walking backwards, uh, and it's shaking and it's not very stable. Once I run it through the software, it smooths it out beautifully. Now, I know Blackmagic also have something similar now, but with their DaVinci software. But when it comes to run and gunning, I'd rather be with this setup rather than this setup. Also, the battery life on this is very decent. You can get up to 40 minutes off of one battery. Oh, this is my Sony a7R4, by the way. <laughs> I also have one of these. I took this recently to uh, a trip with me to Italy with the guys, and this is a 55 mil lens. So it's a very close up lens. It's got a low aperture, so it got me some really nice background blur and bokeh. But yeah, this is like my photography go-to camera and these are my videography go-to cameras. So something like taking pictures of the side bin, I'd use for a7R4 purely because it's a high megapixel camera. It gives you a massive picture. So if you want to crop into it without losing not much detail, that's your go-to. This is the RX100. Now, this is like a very portable vlog camera that the Sidemen would use for something like a hide and seek video. Although we have just recently upgraded all of the vlog cams for them to a Sony ZV-1. Amazing little camera. As you can see, it's very small and portable, which is why the guys like it. And these still film in 4K, so they give you an incredible image out of them. The only downside that I'd say to these cameras, and I only say downside because I've been spoiled by cameras like this, is that they have a small sensor, which results in a very cropped frame. So when you vlog yourself, actually it's not that close up, but like when you have a big potato head like me, it's not like the most flattering of angles. This is a very, very good camera to go to if you're trying to film your first YouTube video because it's got a good price on it, great quality, and it comes ready to use out of the box. Keep it simple. Get yourself a tripod like this. Now you could just rest it, film yourself however you like. Tilt the screen, you can frame up for yourself. Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. Blah, 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 blah. See, it's a very portable solution. Whether it was this, oh. <laughs> and also if you're a streamer, 
uh, definitely you can use this. It's a much cheaper alternative rather than having something like this. And the batteries are nice and compact too, and they last for, I wanna say about half an hour. Yeah, you also have complete manual controls over this camera, but you know what? When it comes to the guys and having manual control over a camera, they have no clue about that. So I usually set it to auto settings, and this is a, you know, it adapts to different environments really quickly, especially if you go from like a dark to a bright area, this adjusts very quick. So this is why I'm recommending this camera to somebody who's more of a bit of a, an, a noob. <laughs> when it comes to quick workflow, I don't really mess around with any picture profiles. I just keep it on the standard one because I feel like the image from the Sony cameras is good enough for web type of content and vlogging stuff. However, if I'm crafting more of a project or I'm filming something more cinematic, I'll usually use a flatter profile on the camera and then I'll color grade from there. I do have another couple accessories that I use if I want more juice out of these. So the batteries that come with these cameras, again, they last from 30 to 40 minutes. However, I do have a V-Lock uh, battery and then I have this adapter. It's a dummy battery and then that connects to there and it powers the camera for a longer time. Typically, I would only use this if I was using the camera on only a tripod. If I'm on the go, I just pack a couple of these batteries with me for the day. I typically pack about four to six batteries into my camera bag for the day. And also these cameras, they have dual <laughs> SD card slots, which is quite handy because they have a function where you can record onto both cards. So if one of your cards corrupted, you have backup footage on your second card. But I use these SD cards from Lexa because they come in at a very good price and they are high speed memory cards. So as you can see at the back, these are UHS-2 memory cards and the transfer speeds you get on them is written on the card. So it says the transfer speed, you get up to 250 megabytes a second. You can get compact flash cards, but they're very expensive. And the maximum Sony do is 128 gigabytes. And they're like 300 quid for 128 gig. I'm not ready for that yet. I don't think I need the type of speeds they offer just yet. However, if Sony'd like to send me some to test, <laughs> I'd happily take them. I own so many of those cards to the point where I have to have multiple cases for them. And let me tell you what, if you're a videographer and you've got multiple SD cards and you don't have an SD card case, just add one to your list, please. Just go and do it now. They're not that expensive and they will change your life. Even if you're an amateur uh, who's just getting into this game, just get yourself one now. When it comes to SD card cases, I'm a bit fussy with them because you can get different types. So you can get a super cheap case like this. This one's actually my buddy's John. I should, you know what, for his wedding gift, I should have given him what a What are you nice saying SD. about John's, are you slagging off his yes, case again? I'm slagging this case off, you know why? What's wrong with it? Isn't, outside, it's fine, right? Inside, I hate when they Ugh. have- Oh, it's disgusting. <laughs> I hate when it has the rubber padding because for me, I feel like it, it has the potential to damage your card. Whereas the one that I have, it's a foam. It's a foam one. So it's less destructive on the plastic for your SD card. That, that's my personal preference, you know? Yeah, this one sucks. This, look, look at these cards, they're all warping. I feel bad, I feel bad for him. I feel like his cards are gonna break and cards are expensive. You wanna treat them good. That's really stressed me out, just going into that topic. If this isn't a bit of you and you want something more compact, I highly recommend this case. It's from Small Rig, it's metal and it fits three memory cards and a couple of uh, micro SD cards and a SIM card for whatever reason. But yeah, this, it feels like a bulletproof case, doesn't it? If you wanna carry around three cards in like a wallet size, this is all you. It's not waterproof though, so it depends on your situation where you are, but if you want a quick access or carry around cards safely, boom, boom, pocket, done. This lens is the Sigma 14 to 24 mil f 2.8. Gets me a super wide image, which is what I love, especially if I'm gonna be spending my time in cramped spaces like the green machine, I need a wide lens. The wide lens, the 14 to 24, I would mainly use this for on the go vlogging. And going back to the 24 to 70 mil there as well, do you find you get a better quality of picture with or without the lens cap on? <laughs> If there's anything I've learned over the you know, past years of being a videographer, is that I found that clients are very impressed when you take your lens cap off. Right, okay. So always take the lens cap off before you press record, right? If you wanna be invited to the next job, yes. What other questions have you got to throw at me, eh? My first ever lens, which I kept for about three years without having to buy any other lens, was back at the time, it was the Canon 24 to 105 mil. And it was an F.4 lens. It allowed me to get anything from 
focal range of 24mm to 105 which was incredible. I didn't really need any other lens. However, it's very, it's, it's good to have a prime lens in your arsenal as well. But if you're on a limited budget and you're starting out, I would say cover your ground by having a zoom lens so you have different types of shots at your disposal. So not everything looked like you shot it at 35mm or 55 mil, you know? Personally, for me, I find that these two lenses is all I need recently. And then every now and then when I need a special touch, I'll go to something like a 35 prime or a 50, 50 mil, nifty 50. Nifty 50 is a very good lens to have. This is the Dell XPS 17. And when I'm on the go, this is mainly what I use for my post-production. So when we're on travel shoots, I need to back up my data or I need to do other post work, I'll go on Premiere, go on Lightroom, go on Photoshop. This is the laptop that I use. At home, I have a PC tower with like like a 3090 graphics card. It's got 128 gig RAM, got a 32 core processor, 32 core i9 processor. I'll put the stats up on screen. But yeah, no, I feel very content with my home build. And this is like my on the go machine right here. So as a videographer, I often get asked by clients if they can see my work. So having a website where everything is on show and is optimized for mobile devices has helped me secure some jobs in the past. So if you also have a business or you're planning to start something up, maybe even a personal portfolio, then why not give yourself a social presence by creating a website. Squarespace is a service for website building and hosting. You can create web pages using their pre-built templates and drag and drop elements to create web pages. And this is my website where I use it basically as a personal portfolio. So this is my landing screen. And then this is my portfolio page where you can scroll through all my different projects, all my different video projects and play them. So this is, for example, KSI Domain. I click play and you can see the video that I produced within seconds. And you can always upgrade to a more advanced package once you need the extra features. Such as a fully integrated e-commerce shop if you're planning on selling digital products or physical goods. I also have a shop if you would like an Icon Films hoodie. I have them for sale. Some pictures here for you. And I love how easy Squarespace is to use. The user interface is really user friendly and you can get set up with a professional looking website within minutes. This is my about me page where you can read a bit more info about me, who I am, what I do. And then I have a video here that plays with my showreel so you can get to see some of my work. And because Squarespace has sponsored this video, I'm able to offer a 14 day free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, use my code Constantine to get 10% off your purchase. The link is in the description. So give that a click and check it out for yourself. So when it comes to website building, that's what I use, I use Squarespace. And in fact, I'm currently in the middle of building a new website for the studio. So I had an old version of this website, completely redoing it up. I'm very excited to show you guys very soon. I am actually filming in my new studio. It's not fully finished, but it's getting there. I'm very excited to share the new update with you guys. The Rode VideoMic Pro Plus. I think this is version number two or something. And then I have the Video Rode Micro. Now Micro is because it's, it's, it is what it is. It's like a micro version, whether it's this one is a bit, longer but you know what it is about the size sometimes i don't want to be too obtrusive on jobs and carry around something like this also this is a this is the best directional microphone i've ever used for out and about shoots you can actually focus on how directional it is and the angle of it so you can have it very direct or you can spread it around more. And that's good because when you're filming your subject, it helps you eliminate all the background noise. With something like this one, um, they're still very handy mic. In fact, I prefer using this smaller one because it packs down into my kit bag a bit more and it's not as distracting. Whether as this one, you see me walking down the street with this, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> A huge difference, especially when the boys are mic'd up with a lapel wire. For me, when I use these, they're more of like a fail safe if something doesn't work on their lapel mics. Or we have like a stranger or a guest that randomly pops in to say something. These microphones are there to capture that sound. Also, it's very handy having these because if there wasn't one and we needed to use the camera audio and I'm a bit out of breath, let's say for example, and I'm filming like this and I'm heavy breathing into the mic. <laughs> It's not, it's not a good look. <laughs> it sounds awful. So yeah, this is a lot more handier. I can be way out of breath and it won't pick up on that as much. <laughs> so yeah, these are my sound solutions for on-camera mics. One of them will set you back about 50 to 60 quid. And this one is in the, I wanna say in the 200s zone. If you don't know about gimbals by now, I don't know what rock you've been sleeping under, but they are the thing that are gonna help you get super smooth footage. And this is the latest gimbal from DJI called the RS3. Now this RS3 allows you to mount your camera on here and then you hold it like so and it gets you super smooth footage. The biggest difference you're gonna see is obviously visually is how smooth your footage is gonna be. And the second difference is gonna be how fit you're gonna be 
after you've been holding this around the whole day. <laughs> you're gonna get some serious biceps after this. But yeah, no, honestly, if you're doing cinematics and you want smooth, nice footage, definitely use this. For sideman shoots, I use this sometimes or I carry it with me in my kit bag sometimes. But the reason we don't use it as much is because we need to be on the go a lot. We need to fit into tight spaces. So having something like this when you're on the fly, documenting fast action, it could be difficult. They, you could experience technical difficulties on the day as well, where the gimbal just like sort of flops on you. It happens and you need to recover from that quickly. But the disadvantage is that you've just probably messed up a shot. So I'd only personally use this on sideman shoots when I need to capture like cool cinematics of like a new hotel room we're in or a new location we've hired, you know? That's where I'd use these. There's different types of gimbals out there and they pretty much vary in size and cost. So you can get smaller ones, but the, they won't be able to handle like the larger cameras. Or if you have a larger camera, you can get a larger gimbal that will handle the payload of it. And my favorite feature of the new RS3 from DJI is the auto lock feature. So you're cam hopping, you're moving around, you're getting your shot and you need to go, you need to pack away, you switch it off and it locks for you and you can just carry on, just carry on walking. You need to switch it back on, you press a button, you press the on button, it does its thing, it switches on and it clicks into place. Look at that, that's my favorite feature of the new gimbal. If, if you're getting like a cheap gimbal, you're probably getting an older generation one. So you're probably losing out on little features and quirks such as like auto lock or the amount of payload the motors can handle. There's nothing wrong with getting used kit. I would prefer anything when it comes to electronics to get it as new kit. But if it's something like a tripod, I would get that used because it doesn't have any electronics in it. So it has, less chances of it going wrong. Anything you buy, just try and buy it with a warranty. These cameras represent the backbone of how we film the content. However, there are other cameras like GoPros and 360 cameras that add a little bit more spice into the shot. And I know you guys have been loving the recent 360 shots we've been capturing. So we have GoPros. This is the GoPro 10. Absolutely love this camera. I've been using it for such a long time, especially when it comes to like behind the scenes for my vlogs. You know what, throughout all of this, there's one important element that's not a camera that I've not talked about. <laughs> Let me get it, hang on. Now, I've never claimed to have great fashion sense, but. Oh, oh don't say that. No, you are, you're a fashionable man. Stop it, Jack. But I'm, I'm all about being practical. I've also got yellow Crocs on. <laughs> yeah, I'm all about being practical. So I found this utility vest on ASOS. It's only like 30 quid and I bought like five of them and they're very reasonably sized. Um, what do I do with it? Okay, I've got a shoot coming up. I've got, oh, I need a couple batteries on me. I'm gonna keep this one uh, and these here. Oh, I need memory card. I need spare memory cards on me. Slot that in there. Oh, I need my BTS GoPro camera. And I just slot that into my pocket here. Oh, I need a 360 camera as well. Um, that can go in this pocket. And then I have like, this around my neck here and I'm like vlogging here and I have another camera like this and I need to put this one away and I need to get this one out there. Yeah? See what I mean? I'm like a Swiss army knife. Whatever the environment demands, I provide. You know in action movies when they're like, come on, give me your gun and the person's like, gives the gun. He's like, and the other one. And then they just take out like all this stuff. That's, that's pretty much me, but with cameras. So yeah. Utility vests, priceless. Where was I, what was I talking about? Action cameras, GoPros. Ah, oh, mate, the amount of time I spend organizing GoPro accessories and, and different type of mounting options for these cameras is insane. I have a whole separate bag dedicated just for those accessories. This bag, what does it consist of? I'm just gonna tilt it to camera like this. I'm not gonna empty the whole thing out. I've got a bunch of like charging cases for the cameras. But um, the main thing you want for something like, for example, a hide and seek shoot or any shoot that requires a GoPro, I've got different solutions of mounting. And those three solutions are a suction cup for when it comes to, you know, something, if we need to film something inside a car, you can just suction this on a windscreen. There you go. Done it to the desk. Then we've got these plastic clamps, which attach to different types of surfaces, mainly just sort of like flat walls with a sticky pad. So usually I would have this sort of base and it will have a sticky pad on it. Now these sticky pads, I often just have them scattered around every single bag because you never know when you're gonna need one. Now, where do I buy these from? Typically, I would go to Amazon to buy all of this stuff. However, I just felt like I was getting scammed by the prices I had to pay for such like sticky pads. So I'd go on AliExpress 
and I'll bulk buy like a hundred of these for the fraction of the price you get them on Amazon. But yeah, basically, if I wanna stick this anywhere, you peel off this little red bit, you'd stick it down on a surface and then your GoPro would be attached to this and you'd slot it in and there you go. And you've got a different variety of movements you, you can do with this. So you can pretty much get any sort of angle with this clamp. And then when you're done, you just sort of unstick it throw this thing away and you move on. Let me give you a little tip. If you're in somebody's house or you're in a location that is expensive and they've got a really nice wallpaper, don't go sticking this on wallpapers because you'll end up peeling the whole wallpaper off and it's just not a good look. The location will hate you, you won't get your deposit back and I know that through experience. <laughs> so try and mount it to surfaces that won't peel off. Also, if you've got dusty surfaces, good to bring a cloth with you so you can wipe off the dust and make that clean. Otherwise, all the dust just covers the sticky pad and it won't be sticky anymore. Now the third thing I have are these clamps with a magic mount and a GoPro adapter. So it's a quarter inch adapter that then converts it to a GoPro adapter. And these are great as well. So these are like my main three things. I'd usually mount this on something like a pipe or I don't know, I can mount it to this worktop that I have here. There you go. And I can angle it in any way. So when it comes to GoPros, these are the main three accessories. But because I have so many GoPros, I don't just have three of these. I have 10 of these. How many GoPros do you have? I need to recount how many GoPros I actually own. I'm pretty sure last time on a previous shoot, on a hide and seek, we had like 11 GoPros. And then like John and James have a couple as well. So we add them onto our arsenal as well. I mean, GoPros accessories don't just end there. You have chest mounts, head mounts, wrist mounts, and I've got all of that type of stuff. So they, they, they do come useful. How long does a battery charge last on a GoPro? GoPro batteries, they're a funny one. It, dep it depends on, a funny, on the conditions, but I'd say you can at least get like half an hour to 20 minutes on a single battery. Again, it depends what mode you shoot in. If you're shooting in like a very high resolution at a very high frame rate, your battery life will go down quicker. Personally, I love opting in for charging cases for when it comes to GoPro batteries that have a lid on them. So this one used to have a lid on it, but it was very flimsy. So when you're charging multiple batteries in something like your backpack and your backpack's rattling around, batteries fall out. But when you have something like this, like an extended wide version of an AirPods case, when you have something like this, it's very handy to have something like this, because then you could just pop a USB in, put this into a portable battery bank, and this could be charging in your backpack. So I've got loads of these cases for when it comes to GoPro batteries. And best believe I'm gonna upgrade, or I'm gonna get a couple more when GoPro released the GoPro 11. So I have like, a mixture. I have GoPro 6s, I have GoPro 7s, typically for like something like a hide and seek that doesn't require much from the GoPros, I would use the older versions because they're just static cameras. Because these old cameras, they don't have great stabilization, whether as the new GoPro 10, you can run around with it and it makes the footage look super smooth, but you wouldn't be able to do that with an older version. But where, where, where it's like a hide and seek video and they're all static, doesn't make a difference. You guys have been loving uh, the 360 camera. Uh, Toby hasn't, JJ hasn't. Yeah, JJ and Toby have been the victims of 360 cameras recently, haven't they? But when it comes to 360 cameras, uh, there's a company called Insta360 and they're the ones I go to. So this is the Insta360 ONE X2. It's a very small compact camera and it has two lenses on it. It's got a screen at the front and it's got a battery slot over here. And then you can pop a micro SD card in there. I love it. And it comes with a, an invisible selfie stick. So you basically mount it at the bottom of the camera. You can extend it and it'll film you and it'll make this whole stick invisible. I've done like loads of videos about this camera already. So if you wanna, if you wanna learn more about this camera, check out this video here. Accessing the footage and then uploading it to like Instagram or something like that is very easy because they've got a mobile app and they've got a PC app, which are both very easy to use. But when it comes to like sideman shoots, um, I remember there was this one specific shot I got of the guys on the mobility scooter and I put it up to the back of their mobility scooter and it looked like, it basically looked like GTA. This is the camera responsible for that angle. Also mounted this to a jet ski once. So yeah, banger, banger of a camera. So another thing that we've been introducing more and more into the Sideman videos are drone shots. Now there are a couple of different drones you can get. You can get small ones, big ones, different ranges. Imagine fitting all of this into that one backpack. You try and be as compact as possible, right? So it's the same when it comes to drones. And my favorite drone is in this box. Now, I typically store it in this box, but when it comes to shoots, I pack it down a lot more tighter. This is the new DJI Mini 3. It's still got this sticker on here that says Josh says FU. Now, the size of this drone, look at that. It's handheld, very easy to manage 
and they've introduced a new mode where you can actually film videos in vertical mode. So it's great for like capturing stories and other stuff that needs to be captured in vertical mode. Battery life on this claims to be 30 minutes and yeah, I've flown it for like half an hour before with without having to change the battery on it. Also comes as, well, I got this as a pro bundle. So the pro bundle comes with a remote that has a screen on it because I don't enjoy clamping my iPhone onto a remote purely because it drains my battery. I'm not able to use my phone at the same time. And I don't know what it is with phones, but when it gets too hot, the brightness of the screen goes down and then you just can't see anything on your screen. And it's, that's just dangerous. You you could crash a drone. Not that I use that as an excuse, but you know, I have a charger hub for it. Very handy. You can slot three batteries into here and then pop them onto charge via USB-C and that will charge up all the free batteries. Another essential thing I have with them is ND filters. I don't know what else to say about this drone. 4K, 50 frames, does vertical mode, packs down really tightly into a bag as well. I'll also show you the other drone so you can like see the size difference. But the main thing which will stop me taking this to certain activities is recently we did jet skiing and the jet skis go pretty fast. So I needed a drone that could keep up with that sort of speed. And on that shoot, I actually bought a different one and it's called the DJI Air 2S. And the Air 2S is an amazing drone. It films in a super high res, it films at up to 5.7K. <laughs> You can see I haven't used it in a while, but that one comes in a slightly bigger case. Ta-da! A bit more of a bigger drone, as you can see. Very beautiful camera on it. The batteries are also a lot bigger on it. And this also has a very similar flight time of 30 to 40 minutes. And again, I opted in for the Pro controller because it has a very big, bright screen. This is a non-Pro controller. So your phone goes on top of the, that here. So I'm not a fan of this. I'm not a fan of having to connect this. I also always forget my cable. I always lose the cable. Here, you don't need to worry about it. Everything's all nice and connected. How much do they both cost? And what's the difference between them? Oh, the, the oh, drones are a money pit, I tell you. This controller itself costs about 800 quid, just, just for this. So each battery is like 50 to 60 quid. You need plenty of batteries. And I think this, the drone itself is like a thousand and a bit. I'll put up the updated prices on screen now. The price difference is almost double. This one's also a bit safer in a way because it has more sensors. So it will stop you from colliding into different obstacles because it has sensors from all the different sides. And Mini 3 has only got front sensors, doesn't have back ones. Can you recommend like a good entry level drone? The DJI Mini 3, that's the best entry level drone you're gonna get. In fact, you could probably go DJI Mini 2 if you wanted something even cheaper because that's like the previous generation and you'll still get banging quality from that drone as well. In fact, I've got one up for sale if anyone's interested. How long does it take to learn to fly a drone? When it comes to learning to fly a drone, I think I'm always learning. I, I have drone anxiety just because I've crashed my drone every like once or twice, you know? Officially, I've fully crashed a drone and lost it once and that was very peak because I just, I just felt the money just go, you know? That was a very sad moment for me. I did recover the footage, thankfully, but it was just a sad day. <laughs> How long does it take? I don't know. You can you can also practice on simulators. My next thing, I want to learn to fly FPV drones. I think that would be very fun. You know what the, the big thing is? It's like watching out for tree branches because tree branches are so thin, you can't see them from a distance. Also getting radar jammed by the US Embassy. That wasn't me, that was Ben. But yeah, he, he tried to fly over. I probably shouldn't talk about it, but he couldn't fly his drone at a certain place. And he he did and they blocked him and when it comes to like storing all of this kit you can have backpacks you can have peli cases you can have more bags personally i love my backpack and i love like an over the shoulder type of bag you can also get something called a peli case which is this you can get them in all sorts of sizes um, I just so happen to have this one and you can get like dividers for them, which is very handy because then you can have compartments for certain things such as like a lens. And you can customize those dividers, right? Yeah, these dividers you can customize however you want. You get like a big pack and then you just cut them to size. This is forever changing for me all of this design. I keep changing my mind of how I want to pack things and what I want to use it for. Do I want to use it just for like a bunch of GoPros like this or for big cameras like this, you know? You sort of find your way as you go through different workflows, but I feel where I do so many different types of videos, I keep changing my mind about how I pack things and the way I use certain types of kit. Does all of this kit belong to you, Con, or does it belong to the Sidemen? Yes, so all of this kit right now belongs to me. I've collected it over many, many years and I also upgrade my kit. So if there's a new device or a new GoPro, for example, coming out, I'd 
try and sell the old version or, or I'd keep it, which is a bad habit. But yeah, I'd also refresh my kit and I would maintain it all. The only recent addition that isn't mine is the boys wanted their own vlog cams, but they want me to look after them. So I have no need for loads of Sony ZV-1s. So they just bought that, but I look after them. Is there any kit that you're looking to buy for yourself soon? I feel like I'm at a happy level right now. There's always something else you can get, but I feel like I've got enough for the type of workflow I have. Again, there's newer models of cameras coming out and I want to keep myself updated with them. So when they come out, that's probably when I'd want something new. But you'd actually find that I'm actually buying more accessories rather than cameras just to help me with the workflow of these cameras. So I'm always buying like clamps and sticky mounts. Out of all of this stuff, what is your favorite piece of kit and why? Like which is the one piece of kit that you would rescue if this whole studio caught on fire? I pray that never happens. Ooh, that is such a difficult question because it's, you're asking me what type of content would I want to, it, it would have to be this rig right here, this right here. This is, this is what I would save. And this camera specifically because I wrapped it. <laughs> this is just a very universal setup. So everything caught fire and I don't own anything else apart from this. I can use this to make me money for everything else. Yeah, because this is this is like my run and gun, my bread and butter right here. You've just said that in front of like all your other children. I know, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, cameras. I love you all, babies. Of all of this kit, is there anything that you regret buying? I regret maybe having this camera. It was meant to be like a vlog camera for myself. But then shortly after I got this one, they released like the ZV-1, which I bought anyway, which was better suited to vlogging. This is more like like a portable photography camera. I don't need that because I've got like a more advanced version of this, for example. So I feel bad for having extra kit I don't really use that much or I have no use for. But you regret it because it's like surplus to requirement, not because it's bad. Yeah, I don't regret it because it's bad. Or I regret, you know, how I used to have, I used to buy monitors for cameras because they didn't have the flippy screen. Now they came out with a flippy screen I feel like all my monitors, I, I hardly use them anymore. So I feel regret in spending so much money on those monitors that I don't use anymore. But that's an easy solution. I can just sell them, right? So what do I regret? Oh my God, there's one camera I regret getting and it is the DJI Osmo camera, the mobile Osmo, the little, the little black one that, I don't know, I never got along with it. I thought it could be a good replacement for the GoPro, but I just found it more fiddly and you got to buy into more accessories. I wasn't a fan of it. How do you make the decision on what kind of kit to bring to each shoot? Do you pre-scout any of the shooting locations or at this point you've done it so long you just know off the top of your head by now? It depends on the type of shoot I'm doing, like a hide and seek. I know I'm going with a gimbal setup, a bunch of GoPros and a bunch of vlog cams, right? If we're doing a game show, it's just all black magics. Um, unless there's a special requirement to fit in a small action camera. Okay, good example, the escape room shoot. I needed to get a close up shot of all the bugs and the like the rat and the stuff. So I knew we're gonna need GoPros and we're gonna need three of them there. So stuff like that. So yeah, I do go on a lot of recce's. When it comes to like location shoots, I'd visit a location a couple weeks before we lock it in. And then I'll be the day before there for like a pre-light session. And that'll give me a rough idea of what I need to bring with me. Sometimes it's like, boys, we're packing everything. <laughs> what are your favorite kind of videos to shoot? On the go or studio? That's so difficult to answer. Cause I love on the go ones for the adventure we get to experience behind the camera. I'm gonna keep referring back to the green machine. <laughs> <laughs> that was such an experience being in that hot, hot car with JJ just constantly screaming. However, I'd also appreciate a studio shoot where we have aircon and I could just, you know, be more relaxed in the sense of I'll have all these cameras I'll set up and then I can dial in the look. I can be in control of the lighting and I know that major unexpected things won't happen. So there's there's like a different type of pace on those type of sets. I think that's why I enjoy filming in general, just because every day is a different day. Is there any kit that you think would improve the quality of like the Sidemen Sunday shoots in your opinion or like kit that you have your eye on like upgrading for, for the production? Yeah, I think at this rate, we've, we've got like decent enough kit. I think it's about upgrading maybe the lighting in different ways. Uh, I know we should definitely step up our lighting game in certain videos or possibly like hiring extra people on the day to help us out and make things run smoother you know it's just like little things like that not so much more as kit but more like the workflow on the day how do you think in your opinion because i know we don't know the answer to this but how do you think this kit set up for the sidemen like rivals other big uk youtubers yeah i don't, I don't know because I haven't really seen much behind the scenes of what other YouTubers do. I mean, Beta Squad are smashing it. Then there's like individual people like Zach, 
Talix, Freezy, their production's always on point as well. I know they've got teams and they smash it. I'd love for us videographers to have a big community where we share like all of our tips and videos. So get out there, share it. Let me see, let me see your setups. Let me see how you make videos. I'd love to see. For me, it's kind of been, I'd adapt on the go. So I'd have a shoot, I'd talk to myself. I'm like, oh, I need to improve on this. What do I need to do for that? Oh, I need this piece of kit. Let me try and obtain it. Let me try and improve on that. Or I'd speak to the boys. I'd be like, boys, what do you think we're lacking? At one point it was like, oh, we need better sound. So I was like, okay, let me look into some sound solutions. Also I can see for myself, or I know when there's a, a big set, I'm gonna need more lighting. So we'd hire an external lighting team for that, or I'd rent some extra kit. So yeah, as, as far as it compares to the production of other UK YouTubers, I, I like how you didn't mention American, because Mr. Beast, Airac, Many more. Not made of money. <laughs> They're levels, so we can only aspire to be like them. Let's talk about studio shoots. Sidemen game shows, 20 versus ones, Tinders. Let's start off with those type of videos. What kind of kit do I use for that? Well, I'm actually filming on two cameras right now. Hello, second camera. And they are the Blackmagic 6K Pros. So a typical shoot day, we have a three to four of these bags. And in each bag are two Black Magic Cinema cameras. Number one, number two. Now it varies from shoot to shoot about how many cameras we need in one go. But for example, something like the recent Tinder video, we used eight Black Magic cameras. And just to make our lives easier on the day for when it comes to setting these cameras up, the content of this bag is pretty much an all-in-one stop shop when it comes to accessorizing these cameras. So hair camera, we usually have these transparent bags that include a couple of essential accessories to make these cameras work. And that includes a data cable, which will help us connect a hard drive to the camera, a V-lock clamp, clamps onto the tripod, and then a battery can slot in here. And last of all, we have a power cable as well. If you forget these two things, it's peak, because this powers your camera and this transfers data to a hard drive, so. Very important stuff. That's why I like keeping it organized in one bag. And then of course, if you're packing two cameras, you'll have two of these same setups. As for the rest of the content in this bag, we just have a couple of cage accessories. So the whole reason why you'd use a camera cage is A, it gives you a lot more mounting options when it comes to accessorizing it. Typically cameras or like DSLR cameras have a hot shoe mount. So you can usually mount something on top of your camera, but when it comes to accessorizing it with more things, then a cage is very handy just because most of them have a lot of holes in here. And these are like quarter inch mounts where you can thread through other accessories. I guess it also protects your camera. If this camera was to fall on one of the corners, it will actually, you know, scratch the metal bit and not the actual casing of the camera. So that's quite handy. We use quite heavy lenses. And what I found is that if it doesn't have this lens support thing, any sort of contact that your hands have with the lens, whether that's focusing or zooming in, it will cause micro jitters in the footage. But once this lens support is on and it's propping the camera lens up from this side, then it eliminates all of those jitters. So when it comes to the type of settings I use to shoot on these cameras, I'm gonna keep it very brief because I feel like that's a whole entire video video by itself. But essentially, I shoot on ProRes, Proxy, 4K, Ultra HD. With the dynamic range, we keep it on video. And the LUT, I use the Gen 5 Film to extended video. The image that comes out of these cameras is absolutely beautiful. I enjoy using these cameras. They're very reliable as well. They don't overheat, or at least I haven't had an experience of them overheating on me. And generally, I just love the workflow of these cameras when it comes to studio shoots. I wouldn't use this as like a run and gun setup because of how bulky <laughs> the camera is. And once you add all the accessories, it becomes very heavy and just not very practical. Plus, compared to like something like a Sony a7S III, this doesn't have great autofocus. In fact, it has no autofocus controls. It's all manual and that sucks. But you know what, for a cinema camera, I don't expect a cinema camera to have automatic control. So these are mainly used for studio shoots. I hardly take them outside. And the most common way to mount it is on a tripod. I mean, the most exciting way we've rigged it up before is probably an overhead shot or on a jib, a whole crane. You would have seen that in the Game of Life video. And we used it on a future Sidemen shoot, which I can't talk about just yet, but we used it again on something very epic and it gave some great results. Another great thing about the Blackmagic cameras is that they are very affordable. For the type of quality and results they give, they are a very good price compared to some of the other cameras out there on the market. If you're an aspiring cinematographer, this is the perfect camera for you to get your hands on. Now you can even go cheaper than these. You can get the Blackmagic 4K. Compared to the 4K model, which is a micro four third sensor, this one is a 35 mil sensor. Lens mount wise, this uses Canon EF mount. So you 
can use a range of Canon cameras or EF mount lenses on the body of this camera. But one of my favorite features is the flippy screen. As you can see here, it flips out and you can tilt it however you like, which makes it very, very convenient, especially if you've got your camera mounted in an awkward position. You just flip your screen and you can still see what you're shooting. Now, prior to this, Blackmagic didn't have screens that pop out. And what I used to do was mount monitors on top of the camera. And that's how I bypass that. But now that they have a flippy screen, it eliminates the need for me to buy and own more kit. And the best feature that they've built into these cameras that they haven't in the previous models is the built-in ND filters. Now for all the cinematographers out there, having built-in ND filters is a game changer. So I know I said I use these on studio shoots only, but we've also used them for football shoots. On the side here, it has an SD card slot and also a slot for compact flash cards. However, I literally have never used that. The only way I've ever operated for these cameras is you get your data cable and you get a solid state drive. Now I've got solid state drives from Samsung. This is the Samsung T5. It's an amazing solid state drive, very fast and compact as well. As you can see in this little case, I can fit up to four drives. So, yeah, so after every shoot, I pull out the drives from the cameras and I slot them in here. Pop this back in the bag and wait till I'm home to do more data transfer. And to fit it in, you don't need to like sellotape it anywhere or anything else. Remember the cage that I talked about? The cage has a specific slot for these drives that goes in here and then the data cable just plugs in there like that. And that's it, your camera is ready to record data. And you get from a one terabyte hard drive, you can get up to 900 minutes of recording time. That's a lot of data. And the beauty of it is when you're done filming, you can simply take out your drive and pop this straight into your computer. And if you don't wanna copy and paste the footage over to your computer, you can edit directly off the drive. But I've gotta be safe and I double back up my footage. So I back it up and the type of transfer speeds I get with this drive, depending on your computer and what drives you have in there. I'm personally transferring it from a solid state to another solid state drive or an M.2 drive and my transfer rates vary from like 400 to 500 megabytes a second. If you're looking to upgrade on any accessory, step up your data game because it will help you save time transferring footage and it's much more safer. So yeah, to round things off, the Blackmagic cameras are a good combination of affordability and high-end production. These are the DZO Picta zoom lenses. Why do I like to use zoom lenses? Um, to have the flexibility of different focal lengths, obviously. So sometimes prime lenses, you know, they're a bit more limiting because then you're restricted to the size of your frame to where you put your camera. So I like the flexibility basically. Lens cap remove, remove, and then you simply line up the red dots, click it in place. Look at this rig. This rig <laughs> looks beautiful. So in each of these boxes, you get two lenses. One of them is a 50 to 125 mil, and then the other one is a 20 to 55 mil. So this is like our wide to mid, and this is our extreme close-up lens, mid to extreme close-up. Now, why do we go for these lenses? So along with affordability, which is always a factor in these things. These give a very beautiful image, almost like a, a vintage style feel. So again, if you're an aspiring cinematographer, I would say this is a great package to have. Each lens comes up to about 2,000 pounds. So this is a 4,000 pound box. <laughs> Which, if I don't know how much you guys know about cinema lenses, cinema style lenses could be very pricey. I've held certain lenses that are like just 20,000 pounds for just a lens. So that's what they use in the big Hollywood movies or music videos. But yeah, I have used some expensive lenses in the past. And so this is the lens support I was talking about earlier. It simply slides on this way, like so. And then this little bit props up and supports the lens. So now when I'm filming on this, it's a very sturdy rig. You're not gonna get micro jitters if you mess around with the lens here. This little accessory coming in at about 40 quid makes a huge difference. A V-mount accessory that clamps on to the tripod. And then we have V-mount batteries. Now, these are high performance batteries with a very high capacity. So it will keep this camera going for a couple hours. And then I have different ones. I've got a BP95 and a 190. Obviously the thicker boy will last longer. This gives the camera about like six hours battery time. And the way you can tell something's a V-mount battery is because it has like this sort of V-lock at the back, which then you can simply slot, boom, and that holds onto your tripod. And then you need the, the D-tap wire. Most V-lock batteries have a D-tap on them. When I say D-tap, it's uh, basically a port. We've got a USB port on the side here for this V-lock battery, and I've got a D-tap 
port here and that's where the cable connects and then the other half of the cable connects to your camera. With Blackmagic you can also plug in something to an AC socket which is perfect you don't have to worry about batteries but I prefer for our setups to be portable and not worry about leads running on the floor because they just create more trip hazards and whatever so I just mainly focus on having this setup with a V-Lock battery and then you just slot your solid state drive into the cage and plugs into your camera boom you're good to go this is it mm, 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 mm. ah yeah just remember to take your lens cap off first rookie mistake you know what been in this industry 10 years and i still do this on every shoot <laughs> so yeah this is a nice solid rig and it's great for studio shoots bosh sorry i'm just having an intimate moment with the camera here i step back and i look at like what we have and it brings a smile to my face some accessories can be super fragile like you've got to spend time on kit maintenance i found basically you're giving your kit a frequent mot <laughs> this is why i'm actually not envious of mr beast collection because that guy in there spends probably all of his time just maintaining kit and looking after it and it's not really the funnest of jobs i'd rather be out on location shooting yeah if you're an amateur videographer and you don't really care about cinematography and learning how to light things and use lenses like this, this probably isn't for you. Another essential when it comes to studio shoots is communication. Now, you might have seen us on behind the scenes videos where we're wearing headsets. Let me introduce you to the Hollyland Intercom C1. Hollyland, I absolutely love this company. They are such a great company to work with and they produce amazing products. Not only do they do these headsets, they also offer wireless video solutions when it comes to streaming video signals and stuff like that. So yeah, check them out. But yeah, in this case, now big up Hollyland, because they actually just sent me these to test out and say, hey Con, how are you getting on with them? Hollyland, I absolutely love these headsets. They are such a big upgrade from the previous ones we used to have. So they just pop onto your head like this. And when you want to talk to your team, you slide this thing down and everybody can hear you. And in this specific package, you get six of these headsets. So you can have up to six people at the same time talking to each other, which is great. You don't have to shout across the field. They also come with these little compact batteries. You get two batteries for each headset, which is very handy as well, because if a battery dies, you simply slot it out and you pop it back into the headset. And the other greatest thing is that they all come in this charger pack. So you can charge up to eight batteries at the same time. Uh, the previous model, you had to pack in every single remote separately, which was a ball ache. So this is such a better solution. Also, the audio signal on these is very clear. You don't get like this muffled sort of radio broken robot voice it's all very clear in hd hd <laughs> that's the wrong terminology but whatever it's just very clear they're very good the range of these is about 300 foot and you can actually buy more headsets so you have a, a bigger team on intercom but yeah these come in clutch especially for big shoots so when it comes to sound i get a lot of questions uh, you guys ask on how do you record all the sound do you have a sound guy do you mix sound live on set the answer is very simple and it comes in the form of these little things this is the tascam dr10 L. This is an audio recorder. You basically plug a lapel wire into it, press record, and it records all of your audio onto a micro SD card. These can handle up to 32 gigabyte micro SD cards. Anything above 32 gigabytes, it doesn't even recognize that it's in the microphone. But 32 gigabytes will give you hours and hours and hours, so it's plenty of data. Typically, I would carry all of the lapels in a pouch like this. They're usually a little bit more well-organized, but for this one, forgive me. And each lapel, I will have labeled with the person's name on it. So for example, I have a Simon microphone on me over here. So I will find a Simon lapel wire. There we go. Now, the reason for this is in the past, we, I've experienced some issues where a lapel microphone breaks. But after a shoot, we put them in a bag. And when I find out later on in post that a lapel wire is dodgy, it's very hard to locate that wire again. So I thought I'd label both things, which should help us eliminate any more problems in further shoots. These microphones, they run on a AAA battery. And usually if you get a fresh battery, it lasts about five hours. If you get a good brand one, if you get like a Duracell or Energize one, is it Energize? Energizer. Energizer, Energizer. They, they're, they're great. They last for ages. I've had like a six hour day before and they just keep running and recording. And then later on in the edit, if you're a Premiere Pro user, you know about auto syncing. You could just highlight all of your clips, right click, synchronize, and everything gets synchronized for you. So when it comes to these microphones, I actually own about 14 of them. So as Sidemen start to introduce more and more guests to video shoots, I thought, oh, bloody hell, I'm just, I'm just gonna have to buy more. So I've ended up doing that. And not only have I bought more microphones, I've also bought more lapel wires. Now these specific lapel wires, they cost 
the same as the unit. They're about 200 pound per wire. Now, what makes them super pricey is that they're waterproof. So when it comes to water activities or, you know, when JJ was in the green machine pouring water all over himself, I wasn't panicking because I knew these are waterproof mics and they'll be fine. And speaking of water, when it comes to uh, water sport activities such as jet skiing, or in a recent video, we went to a place called Aqua Action and basically I did mic up the boys. And my solution to any waterproof sports is these pouches. So what will happen is the actual unit itself will drop down into this pouch and then this will close up and that creates a waterproof seal so no water can get into the pack and then where this wire is all waterproof this is okay to be submerged underwater now learning from my own mistakes the way you should mount this wire onto your talent especially if they're topless you usually loop it like this but you make sure that your capsule over here it's not upright because then it will just collect the water. You want it to be mounted upside down like this, just so the water drains when they submerge out from the water. Yeah, that, I learned that mistake on the Sidemen Hot Tub Mukbang. I was really gassed about using these microphones and then they turn out completely awful. And it was my fault because I didn't mount the microphones upside down. Now, the reason I back Tascam mics so much is that because I've had experience with other microphones out there on the market. And my previous experience was the Zoom F1s. They they were a lot more bulkier and they used two AAA batteries and the battery door on them wasn't secure. So if you got this in your pocket and you touch like the side door of it, the batteries just pop out, which means it interrupts your whole recording. And where I can't monitor these, that's another disadvantage. I can't actually hear what's happening. I just sort of trust these to do their job. And these Tascams have been very reliable compared to other brands that I've used. Another thing I like is that they record dual audio so they can record a track that's at a higher decibel rate and a lower decibel rate, which is a good safety. So if somebody screams and it peaks the mic, then I have a second track that's set to a super low volume and that's usually a safe option. There's a couple of instances where these have let me down, but it's been a very rare occasion where maybe the lapel wire has worn out over time, or maybe, I don't know, the battery door on this is very secure. So there's never been an instance where somebody knocks it and the battery pops out. Overall, these have been incredibly reliable. They also have this belt pack clip, so you can hook it to your waist band or you can just pop it into your pocket. So what happens at the end of the shoot is same as with footage, you take the data from here, so your audio data, you copy and paste it onto your hard drive or computer or whatever, and then you synchronize it separately to your footage. So these aren't wireless microphones, you can't monitor them, but they are very reliable, they record for a long time, they're very lightweight and they fit in. In fact, I'm using one right now to film one. <laughs> How long have we been filming? A whole hour, wow. And then the post-process side of things is it all gets synced up in the edit. We have an editor who edits the whole video and then we pass that edit over once it's finished to an audio mixer. And our audio mixer, Johnny, he will mix all the sound and make it perfect and take out any imperfections from there. So if it's too echoey, he will reduce the echo. If there's a fault in the microphone, he's been able to resolve that in the past. He's on Instagram, so I'll link you his Instagram. He's got some very interesting behind the scenes clips of how he works and what equipment he uses. But audio mixing up to seven tracks at a time is a whole different job. And we have a guy for that. So big up you, Johnny. So we don't only use this for studio shoots. We use this for every single shoot we do with the Sidemen. And then obviously on our cameras, we'll have like backup mics just in case. But this, game changer. The way we'd usually operate this, John on camera, he's a professional now at crash zooming and things. So he'd like be here going boom, 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 boom. It gives you like this freehand look, which I love adding to shoots. So yeah, I think this is officially it for the studio shoots. Now, it's not just all the kit that I have on this desk, it's multiplied by five or 10, depending on the scale of the shoot. But yeah, I hope this has been a good insight for you guys. I feel like I've briefly touched over everything. I could go into more detail about it, but uh, this is sort of the, like a quick rundown. I say quick rundown. This video is probably like an hour long video, isn't it? We've been recording for about four hours, so. I finally got to nerd out and talk about all my kit. So I hope it inspires you to also do the same, I guess, or do it differently. I don't know, share your tips and tricks with me as well. Maybe let me know how we could improve as well. I'm very aware it's not always about the highest of productions or whatever, it's always about the content. So I like to see myself as like a, 
a, a tool. I just call myself a tool. You are a tool. I'm a tool. I like to see myself and other people of the crew as tools to help aid create the content for the guys for you to enjoy and for us to capture the moments that they possibly can't. And yeah, I bet some of the comments in this video will be like, Con, what kit do you want? Yes. <laughs> it's not like that. I've, believe it or not, I have been selective with the type of kit I use. Could have gone with like more Canon cameras. I don't know. You know what, a camera is a camera now. Like the best camera you own is the one in your pocket. That's why most recent times I've been okay like filming a couple of vlog content bits on my phone just because like that's the only camera I have available to me. So remember that guys, when it comes to storytelling and creating really good videos, it's not about the type of fancy camera you own, it's about the story you manage to tell with that camera. So yeah, hope you've enjoyed this video. Have a beautiful time.